it. Here we go. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Thanks, Vanessa, and get the presentation mode going up here. So our topic tonight is understanding your menstrual cycle. I'm Dr. Kelly Moore, and I'm presenting um, with Melanie Badlong. We're talking about the menstrual cycle from both a Western and um, Chinese medicine perspective. And um, before we dive into it, it's always important to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of our goals for this webinar. This is gonna be about learning, about checking in with how your own body's feeling, taking inventory there, and then being inspired and empowered. Um, it's not about being perfect, about judging yourself or about what you should be doing. So with that um, framework, um, it's also important to remember, this is just for educational purposes only. If you would like to dive deeper into any of these issues with Melanie or myself, um, you can schedule with us at Ripple um, and you can certainly ask questions afterwards, um, uh, but it is not considered medical advice. So um, I'm Dr. Kelly, I'm a naturopathic physician. I practice at Ripple Wellness in Washougal and my practice focuses on preventing and treating chronic disease, which includes hormonal imbalances, but digestive imbalances as well, metabolic disorders, primarily using a lifestyle focus to my medicine. And I will let Melanie introduce herself. Hey everybody, um, I am an acupuncturist here at Ripple Wellness. Um, my my big goal in every treatment that I take place in is to really kind of help establish a treatment plan that works for you. Make sure that we're both on the same page in terms of your goal with care. And then at each treatment, kind of reevaluate and make sure that we're still on that path towards, um, towards your main goals. Um, I do that primarily through just helping you and your body find its balance again. So everything I'm doing is really to kind of tilt you in one way or the other back towards your center, um, which is the place where your body can do its best healing and really just encourage your body to do what it knows how to do best and maintain health. Awesome. So Ripple Wellness is a multidisciplinary clinic in Washougal where they have um, naturopathic medicine, acupuncture, massage, nutrition, mental health counseling, and yoga and regular community classes. So if you're interested in staying in the loop on those, we do these monthly at the Camas Library. Um, please put your email in the chat so you can stay in the loop. Um, and let's dive into it. Understanding the menstrual cycle. Now, this is an important topic. For anyone who has ovaries or who has ever had ovaries or who cares about somebody who has ovaries. So that's basically everybody. Um, so I'm glad that you've all joined us tonight and hopefully you can help share this information with other people in your life. Um, we're going to start by meeting our hormones, not all of them, just the, the main ones in the that are involved in the menstrual cycle. So we've got um, the leading ladies, estrogen and progesterone, which um, may be familiar words to you, maybe not. And then we have kind of the behind the scenes backstage hormones that come from our brain, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. We're going to get to know each of those a little bit better, but first let's make sure we all know what a hormone is. We've heard the words hormonal and, and, and hormone, but um, what is a hormone? It's essentially a messenger molecule. It's like one part of your body writing a message to another part of your body. And that the, the hormone is that message. And um, it's hormones are made in a gland and they're sent to a receptor. And those receptors are like little, um, little hands that reach out of the cells. And there's a different type of receptor for each type of hormone. And the main hormone secreting glands in our body are in this diagram. Um, and the main ones we're going to be talking about today are, is the pituitary up in the brain and then the ovaries, which are down here in the pelvis. <clears throat> so starting with estrogen, where is estrogen made? Well, estrogen is primarily made in the ovaries. Um, we make estrogen in our fat cells as well, but when we are in those reproductive years of our life, estrogen is mostly made in the ovaries and it goes all over the body. We have estrogen receptors. So those little hands that reach out of the cells, we have those in our female reproductive system. So in our uterus, um, but we also have them in all of all other kinds of places, our urinary tract, our bones, our hair, our skin skin, our brain, even our heart and blood vessels. Today, we're going to focus primarily on what estrogen does in the reproductive system. And I like to think of estrogen as 
the Beyonce of hormones. I know I'm showing my age a little bit here, um, but this is this is kind of the woman the archetype that comes to mind when I think of estrogen. And the words that I think of are voluptuous and juicy. So estrogen um, in relation to the to the female um, reproductive system, estrogen's mission is to get the body ready to reproduce and receive a fertilized egg. So um, estrogen is helpful in the de development of female sex characteristics, so breasts and hips, um, building up that uterine lining. And I'll show a picture of the uterus again in a minute, but that's um, the organ in our pelvis where um, an implanted egg would kind of nestle in and start to grow into a baby. You need that lining to be really nice and cushy for that um, fertilized egg. And that's estrogen's job to build up that lining. But estrogen also tries to get our body ready um, to get that egg fertilized. So it's responsible for vaginal lubrication, sensitizing of the genitals, but also making our skin glow, making our features more symmetrical, giving us more confidence, making us feel creative. Estrogen needs to be balanced out with its partner, progesterone. And progesterone is made in something called the corpus luteum. So here is the, the uterus. And then off of the uterus, we have the um, fallopian tubes. And then we have the ovaries, which is kind of like a clump of grapes. And each of those grapes has the potential to um, release an egg. And if that egg is, if an egg is released from that follicle, um, I'm using grape as a metaphor. If, if, if um, an egg is released from that follicle, that follicle turns into what's called a corpus luteum and it makes progesterone. Where does progesterone go? It also has receptors in the uterus. And um, why is it this going? Oh, the breast, the brain, the bone, and the blood vessels. And I like to think of estrogen as the Enya, which may be um, even older than Beyonce, but the Enya of hormones um, calming and stabilizing. So whereas estrogen is um, really kind of voluptuous and juicy, we have progesterone to balance out those tendencies. And um, one of the main jobs of progesterone is to hold that uterine lining in place so that, that if there is a fertilized egg there, it can start to grow and develop into a fetus. And so you have to have progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. Um, also early breast development, and it protects our breasts against cancer. So behind the scenes, just like when you have a show on stage, you have the actors in the front, but what's going on behind the scenes is really important as well. So behind the scenes in our menstrual cycle, we have hormones coming from our brain. And one of those is called follicle stimulating hormone. And um, that's a, a hormone that comes from our brain. It talks to our ovaries and the note that it's writing is saying, um, start to ripen some of those grapes. So if you think about your ovaries as having a bunch of grapes, FSH is telling those grapes to ripen and one of them to turn into an egg. Um, and then luteinizing hormone um, also has some important jobs in, in the cycle. It stimulates the follicle to release an egg and also for that corpus luteum, that leftover shell of the egg to produce progesterone. So let's, let's start to look at some pictures to help make this all clear. Um, we have our, our typical menstrual cycle we'll say is like an average of 28 days, but it varies from person to person. We'll talk about what is considered normal and what's considered short or long, but essentially you have the part of the cycle, the two weeks of that cycle that is pre ovulation and the two weeks of the cycle that is post ovulation. And then in terms of the ovaries, you have two phases. You have the follicular phase where the grapes are, are ripening. And then you have the luteal phase where the shell of one of those grapes that had released an egg is gonna secrete progesterone. And then in your uterus, you have three phases. You have your period, when, when you're bleeding and you're shedding that uterine lining, the proliferative phase where that uterus starts right back up to, to growing and thickening again and getting ready for another potential egg to be implanted. And then you have the secretory phase. So let's kind of get to understand these a little bit better. Um, we'll be referring back to this picture a lot. And I know it looks confusing in the beginning, but I'm going to talk you through it. In the middle of your cycle is when you ovulate. So that's when the egg is released. And that is when you're fertile. That's when you're capable of getting pregnant. Uh, at the beginning of your cycle, this red circle, that's the period, that's when you're bleeding. Um, but this whole, this whole month is considered your menstrual cycle. So you have the seven days of bleeding or up to seven days. And then you have the week that is that phase where the uterus is growing, the proliferative phase. And then over here, after ovulation, you have the luteal phase. And here we'll get to see what's happening with the hormones. Um, FSH is that hormone that comes from the brain and talks to the ovaries, and that's in yellow. And here we have estrogen, the Beyonce of hormones in blue. 
and progesterone, the Enya of hormones in purple, and then luteinizing hormone in uh, orange. And we'll, we'll come back in, to that picture quite a bit. So the first half of your cycle, the first phase of your cycle, it's really important. If you go to the doctor's office, a lot of times they'll ask you, when was your last menstrual cycle? Day one is the first day of your period. <clears throat> so that's day one of your cycle. That's your uterus. It's, it's realized that there's no egg that's been implanted. It's going to shed that lining and it's going to start afresh. And this happens because of that drop in progesterone that we see here at the end of this um, cycle when progesterone drops, the uterus sheds its lining, and that is what causes you to bleed. <clears throat> and you're shedding that lining. And this is accompanied by a drop in serotonin, which is a feel good neurotransmitter, which is why we sometimes don't feel so good on that, that week of our period. And also, if there's um, some inflammatory chemicals there that help the uterus. Um, to shed that lining. And that can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, um, especially in our pelvis and our abdomen. So it's kind of interesting to think of our cycles as seasons of the year. In this cycle, the, the um, first part of our cycle when we're bleeding can be thought of as winter. Um, we tend to be more reflective. We want to be kind of more quiet and inward. We actually have stronger willpower during this time, but we may have a lower mood. Although interestingly, we have no change in cognition. And this had to be studied by scientists because there was a rumor that women were less smart the week of their period. And that's not true. So don't let anyone tell you that. It's been scientifically disproven. Um, it might be harder to sleep because of the low hormones. Um, but if you do, when you do sleep, you may have more vivid dreams and you might crave um, more comfort foods because of that inflammation. It is, if you are sexually active, it is considered safe to have sex during your period, but you can technically get pregnant. Um, although it, it's very unlikely, it's possible. So it's still important to use protection and contraception during that time. Um, so we talked about this first phase. Let's go on to the next phase of the cycle. This is when the uterus is now building back up. It's always optimistic that there's gonna be a fertilized egg and it's always ready. So it's gonna start building right back up again, <clears throat> days seven through 13 of your cycle. And this is the full, it's also called the follicular phase because that's when those grapes on those ovaries are starting to ripen to potentially turn into an egg. Estrogen, the Beyonce of hormones is the dominant hormone in this phase. And it's causing that uterine lining to get really thick and ready for a fertilized egg. <clears throat> now, this can be considered the spring of your cycle. Um, that rising estrogen, remember that's associated with serotonin. So you might feel better, more optimistic. You're going to have increased testosterone as well. So you might feel stronger, stronger. You might feel more outgoing and social. Um, creative, sleep better, fewer cravings, more energy, and um, potentially an increase in sex drive right before you ovulate. So it's a time to be extra aware of that and, and careful. Um, and then we have ovulation. This is just a short period, uh, just a, a, a day or two where that egg is released and it's ready for fertilization. So um, it's only um, kind of alive and ready to be fertilized for 24 hours, but sperm can live inside the fallopian tubes for three to five days before that. So for women who are trying to get pregnant, we say, make sure that you have sperm waiting for the egg, at least, you know, the first, the couple of days before you ovulate. Now, if you're not trying to get pregnant, it's important to not have sperm waiting for the egg during that time. So just really important to know that you will be fertile um, a couple of days before you ovulate because um, sperm can live for a while. And um, we have some, our body gives us other clues about ovulation. Um, one of those clues is cervical, cervical mucus. So the cervix, cervix is kind of the bottom of our uterus. It's like a little bottleneck and it secretes mucus that changes throughout our cycle. And during this phase of the cycle, it becomes really slippery and kind of looks like an egg, egg white texture. So it's important as you start to understand your bodies to pay attention to the different discharge you might find in your um, underwear when you go to the bathroom that um, vaginal discharge that's clear and slippery like egg white, that is completely normal. And that means that you're fertile. Um, you can also sometimes feel like a sharp pain on the right or left side of your body called middle schmerz. And that is um, kind of the pain of that, the sensation of that um, grape bursting open and the egg coming out of it. Um, this ovulation period can be thought of as like the summer of your menstrual cycle. You're gonna have your most 
energy, um, be, um, especially mentally alert, you might be feeling extra social and also extra willing to take chances. Um, you may want to eat less and exercise more, which is thought to be an evolutionary adaptation to hunt less for food and more for potential mates. And you're going to have a higher sex drive during this time as well. It's interesting that you might want to, um, kind of dress up a little bit more during this time and women are more prone to binge shopping during this time. So it's something to be aware of too. Um, so then we have that final phase of our period, um, that the second two weeks, which is the um, luteal phase, when the, the uterus is kind of just waiting to see if, a, if an implanted egg is going to start to grow. And during that time, um, we have a rise in progesterone. And remember, progesterone is the in you have hormones, it's calming, it's stabilizing, it helps to balance out estrogen. Um, some normal symptoms you might feel as the estrogen and progesterone start to decline in that part of the cycle is just a little bit of increased sensitivity to pain. You might have looser bowel movements or looser poops. Um, your pelvic pelvis area might feel a little bit heavier just because that uterus is bigger because it's full of blood. And you might have mild cramping because the uterus is starting to contract to get rid of that lining. Um, you can also have a little bit of fluid retention, just be feel a little bit puffy. These are normal symptoms. We're going to talk later about symptoms that aren't normal for your menstrual cycle, but these are normal symptoms. <clears throat> All right. This can be thought of as like the autumn of your menstrual cycle. Um, you're going to feel better in that first week and less energetic. And in that second week, as things start to decline, that's when you may start to feel those PMS like symptoms, um, your blood sugar, you are more sensitive to sugars during this time. And um, you may have a lower libido, but interestingly, you might be more inclined to nurture your supportive relationships like friendships and um, relatives, people in your community. And that's thought to be an evolutionary drive to um, foster those social connections that are important for raising a baby. So <clears throat> we talked about the four seasons of the cycle, the three stages that our uterus goes through during that cycle. It's a lot of information and I'll send these slides out afterwards, but it's important to just start being aware of that and paying attention to what's happening in your own body. And one of my favorite ways to do that, and I recommend this to all of my patients who are cycling is to track your cycles. And I like to use an app called Clue, but there's many different apps. And at its most simple, you can just put in the days that you're bleeding. Um, but you can also put in signs like that cervical mucus, you can put in your moods, you can put in how well you sleep and it can really help you to understand your body, but also it can help your doctor. If you are having symptoms, or if you are trying to get pregnant or trying not to get pregnant, can help your medical provider to understand what's going on in your body. So really great to start doing that. So. Um, it's important um, now that we kind of understand the menstrual cycle to know that this, this is giving us a lot of information about our bodies to the extent that the, um, it is considered a vital sign. So a vital sign is um, something that a clue that our body gives us that um, it might just be one piece of information, but it gives us information about our whole. So it's really important to pay attention to this and not just ignore it. And so we're going to talk about, um, you know, things, clues from your menstrual cycle that might um, give you an idea that there's an imbalance in your body you want to pay attention to. But when, as we go through that, just keep in mind, there's no such thing as perfect. What is normal is what's normal for you. And that's why it's important to start tracking your periods so that you know what's normal for you. So you know when things aren't normal. Things to look out for is big changes in what's considered healthy. And I'm about to go through that big and persistent. So persistent means it lasts month after month, big and persistent shifts in what is normal for you. So let's say normally you don't bleed very heavily. And then all of a sudden you start having heavy bleeding that can signal that there's something happening um, deeper in your body that you want to look into. And then anything that affects your quality of life. If your period means that you can't play the sports that you want to play, or you have to stay home from school, or you have to take medications, um, then um, that means that there's an imbalance that can be addressed. So anything that affects your quality of life makes it um, harder for you to get along with people, um, during that week before your period, that is all, those are all things that you can, you can address and that you don't have to live with for the rest of your life. So what is normal? <clears throat> so for teenagers, our cycle cycles can be between 23 and 90 days. It's really normal for those cycles to kind of fluctuate when you first start menstruating. 
But by the time you're in your 20s, all the way to your 40s, an average um, cycle length is 28 days and normal is anything from 26 to 34. So anything less than 26 or more than 34 is considered to not be normal. And it could be a sign that there's something going on in your body hormonally. And then the length of the period, the length of time you're bleeding, it, normal is considered anywhere from three to seven days. So if you bleed more than that, then that's something you want to talk to your doctor about. And then there's the amount of bleeding. <clears throat> so it's important to kind of pay attention to this. You don't want to be using more than six pads or tampons a day. And over the entire period of bleeding, you want to be, um, you know, don't want to be losing more than about six tablespoons of blood. Most of us don't measure our period blood in tablespoons. So it's more, it's easier just to keep track of how many pads and tampons you're using. If you're using more than this, that's something to tell your doctor about. It's also not normal to experience pain that's stronger than those mild intermittent cramps that I talked about as being normal. So you shouldn't need to take ibuprofen every day during your menstrual cycle. You shouldn't need a hot water bottle every time you menstruate. You shouldn't have really tender breasts that mean that you can't hug somebody when you menstruate um, and no headaches or migraines. If any of this is happening, that is a sign. That's a vital sign that your body is giving you that there's an imbalance in your body that can be addressed and you can talk to your doctor about. So remember hormones are messengers. Um, and the symptoms that they um, accompany them are messages that you want to pay attention to. Although there's no such thing as a perfect cycle and your hormones are going to change throughout your life, depending on if you go through a stressful event, if you're traveling, if you're not eating enough, if you're exercising too much, um, if you have major life changes, but new shifts that can't be explained by travel or by a stressful event. Um, and if they last longer than a few months is something you want to talk to your doctor about. All right. Let's see what it said. Hmm. There we go. Sorry, this seems to be frozen. <laughs> Give me just a second here. What happened? Let's see, Melanie, do you want to pull up your screen real quick? Because mine won't let me even leave here. Let's see. What is going on? I'm sorry, ladies, just bear with us one minute here. I'm going to stop sharing and see what's going on. Hmm. Yeah, my whole computer just froze. Melanie, is yours working? You're on mute, Melanie. Sorry about this, ladies. I'm in it. Cool. Um, so um, if you want to share your screen and just open it to presentation mode, and I'll... Um, okay. okay, let's see. I think I'm in presentation mode, but I, let's see. Now. Wait, how did it get here? Oh, it must be, okay. Hmm. Will it let me share? Okay, more share screen. You put the share your screen. There you go. Okay. Um. Okay, you can see. Is how does that look for you? That looks great. Okay. <laughs> um. I just had. Yeah. If you could just go back. Right there, right there, right there. Go back to listening to your body. Yep, yep. And then just click through that. I think I finished this one. So if you go to the next one for me, okay. Real quick, let's talk about what is an irregular cycle. What would sign that you need to um, take a deeper dive? So anything less than 26 days or more than 34 days. 
Um, if the month to month variation is greater than four days, so if some days you have a if some months you have a 26 day cycle and some months it's 30 and that lasts for, you know, month after month, then that's something to pay attention to. If the bleeding part of your cycle, the period is less than three days or more than seven, or if it's excessively heavy, if you're going through a super tampon in two hours, that's excessively heavy, or if you have excessive pain. And then one more slide, Melanie. Yeah, so specifically what is heavy bleeding? So if it lasts more than eight lit days, if it interferes with your ability to do daily tasks, if you're regularly soaking through those big maxi pads or tampons or changing them every two hours, if you ever see a clot larger than a quarter, um, so like a, a clump of blood larger than a quarter, um, all of this can be associated with fatigue because you're going to be losing a lot of blood. And that means that you could start to get anemic. So paying attention to how much you're bleeding your cycles, you can track all of this in an app. So you can really start to understand what's normal for you. And if something's happening month after month, that's not normal. That's when you want to go and just bring it up with your doctor. And if your doctor says, oh, just, just take medication and suppress that symptom, then you might want to think about um, working with a provider who's going to help you dive deeper into what's happening. And I'll just hand over to Melanie now. Thanks, Melanie, for rescuing me. <laughs> no problem. Good job, Kelly. That was <laughs> kind of a perfect setup to talk about um, understanding your menstrual cycle from a Chinese medicine perspective, because she really outlined um, what you can expect in terms of cycle length, um, what a normal cycle is. And I'm going to touch on all of those things, but from a Chinese medicine perspective. So I want to kind of set you up to with the vocabulary that I'm going to use um, so that it can kind of make a little bit more sense, because sometimes it sounds like a second language um, when we talk about um, things in Chinese medicine theory. So um, something that I'm going to talk a lot about is your chi, which you can kind of think about as like your vital force behind all of the pathomechanisms in your body, your organ function. Your chi is what really drives your blood flow, um, moves your breath, um, and it, it courses through you in what we call meridians or channels. So in acupuncture, we think of the body as having these um, channels that run kind of from head to toe or toe to head. Um, and within those channels, we can tap into the chi of our body to help promote healthy balance within our systems. So chi is something that you're going to hear me um, comment on, and you can kind of think about it as like the energy that's that's coursing through you. Um, another thing that you'll hear a lot through this presentation is um, yin versus yang. So when we think about yin in the body, the yin is really like the fluid, the substance. Um, and the yang is that like the force behind it. It's the energy. It's the um, it's the fire that moves things, right? So yin and yang is something that in Chinese medicine, we apply to everything. So it's, it's the opposites here in this diagram. You can think about the um, gray or the black part here as your yin and then the white part here as your yang. So women are more yin, male are more yang. We have um, the moon is a yin, the sun is yang. So you can kind of think about anything in the world in terms of yin and yang. And in Chinese medicine, we think about yin and yang as a really crucial part of our menstrual cycle. So just as Kelly's presentation had the 28 days um, listed in different phases, we have it here with this um, diagram here to think about it in terms of a Chinese medicine perspective. So we have two parts, day one through 14, we can think of as our yin phase. So days one through 14, your yin is growing, you're building up that blood to really nourish the uterine lining that Kelly was talking about. And then day 14 through 28 is that yang energy. So that's what helps um, expel the egg. Um, like she was discussing about the grapes kind of releasing an egg. That's that yang energy that's really pushing that egg to drop. Um, 
all of that energy she was talking about in terms of like spring and summer, that's our yang energy. So she did a really good job of kind of touching on those seasons throughout the cycle. And why I think about that all the time um, with my practice as well. So, and then you can break those two different yin and yang phases down into four phases. So phase one is your bleeding cycle. So that's days one through seven. It's in Chinese medicine during our treatments, when we're focusing on regulating menses or maintaining a healthy balance with your menstrual cycle, we think about um, how our acupuncture treatment is going to help to support the, the changes within the cycle. So days one through seven, we're going to either move the blood. If it's kind of stagnant or slow, we're going to help encourage that blood to flow freely. Um, and then if you're having a really heavy um, period, which we call menorrhagia, that we're thinking more about like stopping or slowing the bleeding so that you're not having those excessive bleeding and depleting your blood, um, which can leave you anemic, which she just kind of talked about. Um, phase two, the proliferative phase, that's days seven through 14. So that's like leading up to ovulation. That's when we really want to nourish you back up from a Chinese medicine's perspective. We're nourishing your yin, your bodily fluids, which helps to build up your blood um, and nourish your blood as well. So two different ways to help nourish you back up. You may notice that right after you're done bleeding, you especially if you're having excessive or heavy periods, you might notice you're pretty depleted. You feel like you're low energy, you've lost a lot of blood. So a big part of our treatments is really nourishing you back up, bolstering you back up and um, helping to create this nice healthy place for your uterus to receive an egg, if that's what your um, goal is to get pregnant, which your body thinks that that's your goal each cycle as Kelly also talked about. So um, nourishing up your blood and your yin so that your uterus is a nice place for that egg to land. Um, and then phase three is ovulation. So ovulation is when we want to nourish your essence. Essence in Chinese medicine is an interesting, um, it's an interesting kind of perspective, but we believe um, from a Chinese medicine stance that you come into this world with a certain amount of essence. It's really like your, your genetic makeup, um, which everybody has their own kind of um, genes that they receive from their parents at conception, right? So during ovulation, nourishing your essence is going to ensure that you're passing on um, healthy, strong essence within your egg to your next offspring, if that's the goal, right? So nourishing the essence during ovulation and then Phase four, your luteal phase, as you're approaching the bleed, we really want to help to tonify your yang. So that fire energy that your body has, um, we want to build that up, nourish that summer cycle that Kelly was talking about and help to move your liver chi. Your liver chi in Chinese medicine is really helping to maintain smooth flow of chi and blood. Um, and also your emotions. So a lot of our common PMS signs and symptoms the week before a lot of us that have those PMS signs can tend towards irritability. That's the emotion of the liver. So when your liver chi is stagnant, when you're approaching that bleed and you're feeling slightly irritable, slightly um, like your fuse is short, that's some stagnant liver chi. So what we do in um, our treatments together is really help to move that liver chi so you feel you feel good. Um, when I see you and we're talking, it doesn't matter if you're coming in for menstrual irregularities or menstrual support or not. If you're a menstruating person, I'm going to ask you all of these things. So it's really important um, to find a little bit of awareness around all of these things so that you can start to recognizing your signs and symptoms and knowing where you're at in your cycle and understanding your cycle. So I want to know, I think it's important for you guys to just kind of tune in a little bit to your own body and see if you're able to answer all of these questions if you were asked. And then over your next couple of cycles, you can start to pay closer attention to what's going on internally. Um, and what I really look for is I want to know about 
the color of the blood. So that can range quite a bit. We can have really pale, light blood, and then we can have really dark, purple, red blood. So anywhere in between, um, we and sometimes we land somewhere on that spectrum, like in the beginning of our period, maybe different to the end of our period, right? So taking note of that, how much blood Kelly already talked about, the consistency of the blood. I want to know if there's clots or if it's really thin and kind of watery. I want to know if it's viscous and slimy or if it's thin. Um, how many days you're bleeding, that's that length. And then also your full cycle length. So the average being 28 days, but not everybody lies on there. Um, I'm interested in your vaginal discharge. Kelly already talked about kind of a healthy vaginal discharge. Um, and if it strays from that, that can also clue us into things that are going on internally that might need a little bit of support. So if your vaginal discharge has any other color to it, any odor, if it's copious, if you don't have any, those are all important things to check in about. Um, your breast changes during your menstrual cycle or leading up to your cycle. Um, your libido, so that's your sex drive if you are <clears throat> engaging in sexual activity. Um, any recent exams you have, I want to know. Um, so typically like a pap smear or something like that. Oh, discharge is on there twice. Okay. Another thing that I check in about with all of my patients, um, but can be particularly helpful with my menstruating patients is your tongue. So this is something that not everybody thinks about, but I ask all of my patients to show me their tongue. So um, no one likes showing me their tongue, but it's so informative. And if you start to pay attention to your tongue, um, you can also find that that's a helpful tool to clue into your body. I think in terms of our menstrual cycle, the most important one is going to be this tongue body color. So if it's pale, that's usually, if it's pale or close to a white, that's usually a sign of um, blood deficiency, or you may have just a lack of blood, you may also be losing too much blood. And then when it gets closer to this dark red, scarlet, purple color, that's typically like a blood stagnation sign. So we in Chinese medicine really think about the, how the blood is moving through the body and we want the blood to move freely um, without stagnation. Because when we have stagnation, we have pain. Um, we all, when we have stagnation, we have stagnated emotions. We have, um, in terms of our menstrual cycle, when we have stagnation in our blood, that's typically what we're seeing with cramps and clots. It can be really uncomfortable. So um, this purple tongue may show sign of blood stagnation that you might see in heavy cramping or clotting, which can be very uncomfortable. Ooh. Okay, I also check in about the tongue coat. So how thick your coat is, if it's wet, if it's dry, all kinds of things like that. But in, for this, um, for this, I just really want you to start to clue into the color of your tongue. So checking in, is it pale? Is it red? Is it purple? That's going to tell you a little bit about the quality of your blood. Um, and in Chinese medicine, we have a few key players in our menstrual balance. So Chinese medicine looks at our organ systems in an interesting way. Um, and you can kind of think about the organs in Chinese medicine terms more as like the energetics of the organ as opposed to like the Western function, right? So we know what our heart does, it's pumping our blood. In Chinese medicine, we think about it as the governor of our blood and the heart blood is what nourishes the uterus. So we have a channel, a Chinese uh, acupuncture channel that connects the, the heart to the uterus there. So each month we're filling our uterus with our heart blood. Our heart blood needs to be nourished to be able to fill our uterus and nourish our uterus so that we can nourish an egg. Um, These three here, heart blood stasis, 
heart blood heat and heart blood deficiency. Those are some common things that we can see when the heart is out of balance. So heart blood stasis is that stagnated blood that we're talking about, and that can leave you with painful periods. We also have some heat that can happen. So when we have heat in the blood, our blood moves recklessly. You can kind of think about hot and cold um, in terms of like an ice cube or in terms of water. So like when we have warm water, it moves freely. When we have cold water, it's ice, it's cold, it's stagnated, right? So when there's heat in the blood, it can help to thin out that blood and move recklessly. And that can lead to heavy periods can also lead to early periods. If there's heat in the blood, that's the liver. So we'll get there. Um, with heart, this heart blood shoe, this is deficiency. So when we have a deficiency of blood, we have a scanty or light flow. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the liver is a really important part of our menstrual cycle as well. Our liver in Chinese medicine is in charge of storing the blood. So it the liver stores the blood and helps to regulate the blood flow in the uterus. Um, when our liver blood is stagnant, that's that blood stagnation that can lead to clots, cramps, and pain. When the liver blood is stagnant, it can also lead to that emotional stagnation, irritability, and those types of PMS symptoms. Um, when the liver is not properly storing the blood, we have amenorrhea or no period. Um, and then here's that blood deficiency, another like scanty or light periods. You can see that with the blood deficiency. If there's not enough blood, if we're not full with blood, we're not going to be able to have a healthy flow of menstrual blood. Um, and then the spleen is another big player in the game. So the spleen in Chinese medicine, we talk about in terms of controlling the blood, it helps to hold the blood in the vessels. Um, it's also the source of chi and blood. So spleen, we can, we can go into this forever. It can get kind of complicated, but the spleen in Chinese medicine is a really big part of our digestion. So when the spleen is, is strong and healthy and we're uh, allowing, um, when we're putting in fuel, that's really fueling our body and able to help our spleen make some really rich, healthy blood, um, then we have a healthy flow, right? But if we have a weak spleen, a weak digestion, because we're not putting in nutrients and support, then we'll have a lack of blood. Um, Spleen chi shoe, spleen chi deficiency is something I see so often in clinic. And um, this can be kind of like a deficient spleen. So a weak spleen that's not working well for you to make blood. Um, this can lead to like fatigue or heavy sensations in the body. So like when your spleen is weak and it's not kind of moving the blood properly or building up the blood, we can feel kind of weak, fatigued, and really heavy. Um, I'm going to move through, through these quickly because I know that we're like low on time here. Um, the kidney is very important. The kidney is the origin of our menstruation. Um, it's what kind of kickstarts our menarche. So menarche is the um, your first menstrual period. That's the start of your first cycle. Um, and we in Chinese medicine call that Tian Gui, which translates to heavenly dew. And I just think that is so special <laughs> because it really is, it's a special time. Um, and I want to kind of set you guys up to think about your menstrual cycle in a beautiful way. Um, and I think that does a really good job. It's like, it's, it's a really important part of our, of our every month. Um, and starting to understand your cycle in a way that you can like respect it, love it, honor it, cherish it is going to help you feel a lot better. Um, some really common ones that I see, particularly in older women who are menstruating is kidney yin deficiency. So our yin is again, that substance, our fluid that fills us. Um, and as we age, we lose our yin. So we kind of dry out when we're entering into like perimenopause, menopausal stage, um, we're deficient or 
losing our yin, and this can lead to dryness signs all over, insomnia, hot flashes, and night sweats. So that's something that I think a lot of my, um, you know, 30 plus women experience. And then we can think about kidney yang deficiency. Yang is again, that fire. It's a really like driving force behind your, your body. Um, and it's, and it's pathology and its mechanisms. And without that fire, we feel really fatigued and weak. Um, when your yang is deficient, when you have deficient kidney yang, you might also notice that you're extra tired right around ovulation because the yang is again what kicks out that egg and helps to encourage the um, corpus luteum to drop the egg. And if we're already deficient in our yang, our body had to use so much energy to push out that egg that we feel fatigued afterwards because we have nothing left essentially. So some people might experience that. And I think that's one that gets overlooked a little bit. Um, and then when your kidney chi is deficient, you also have weakness, but um, frequent urination is something interesting that I think a lot of people also don't get clued into. Um, so kind of noticing your urinary signs and how, how often you're urinating throughout the day can be helpful. Kelly did a really good job talking about irregular cycles. I'm just going to kind of touch on them in a Chinese medicine perspective. So when we think about early periods, that's the, chi, that's, a, it could be a couple of things, but sometimes it's the chi not holding the blood. So that's your spleen holding the blood in the vessels. If your spleen chi is weak, it's going to not be able to hold that blood. Oftentimes there's a force pushing it out, right? So if we have chi weakness, it's not able to hold, but then heat can be a really big player in this game too. When we have early periods, because the heat helps to move that blood in a reckless way. Um, and this is like an internal heat. So you might, if you have heat signs like this, you might also have the night sweats, the insomnia, um, five palm heat, which is like hot palms, feet and chest. This is likely more, um, applicable for women who are kind of entering into that perimenopause or menopausal stage of life. Late periods um, can be cold, cold in the uterus, cold again, you can kind of think of as like an ice cube. Like if it's, if your fluids are getting cold, they're stagnating, they're slowing, and they're going to come a little bit late. You may also experience late periods if you're deficient in your blood. If you don't have enough uterine lining built up, you're, you're potentially going to have a late bleed because there's not enough substance there. Um, and then irregular periods, I think of in terms of like, sometimes it's early, sometimes it's late. I don't know what my average cycle is because it's all over the board, right? Um, and that's really a disharmony between your chi and blood. The chi is a commander of blood and the blood is a mother of chi. So those two things, the chi and blood, they go hand in hand. Um, chi moves the blood, Without this harmony there, we're going to have irregular cycles. Um, flooding and trickling, I think, is something important to um, note, too, is that we haven't really touched on that, that sometimes women spot through their whole cycle. That's what we think about trickling. And then flooding can be like a elongated period. So bleeding for more than like seven to 10 days, but then you're also not stopping. So like, and then you're spotting a little bit. And that, um, that is something that we really want to regulate pretty quickly because we don't want you losing blood for your whole month, right? So that's going to leave you really depleted. Um, and we need that blood to be built up. So I know that was a lot of Chinese medicine talk and it can feel kind of confusing, but know that I'm always here to explain it. If you have any questions or if you want to come see me, um, a lot of my treatments consist of educating my patients on Chinese medicine theory. And that takes a lot of time. I did it for four years and I'm still learning, right? So um, I'll leave you with that. It can be kind of confusing, but I'd love to explain to you more. And then these, this last slide here is just you know, last tips to help you feel like you're 
you're a little bit in control of your menstrual cycle, right? So making sure that you have, that your spleen and your digestion is able to make blood through having enough nutrients and protein. That's a really important part. Um, nutrients are what we need to have sufficient yin and blood. So like I said, we're making our yin and blood through the food that we eat. Um, and this like yang, this fire energy that we have within us can be depleted with cold and raw foods because our digestive function is fueled by our fire or our yang. So when we have cold, raw foods coming into our digestion all the time, we're depleting that fire, that yang. And then um, we're left with some you know, fatigue, weakness, cold signs, cold hands and feet, things like that, um, because we have no yang energy to really help force through us. So I think that's that's a really helpful tip, especially as we're moving into fall and winter, ladies. I really want you to warm up those veggies, um, avoid the cold drinks, things like that. Think about the temperature of the food because you, we really need, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, it's cold and damp and we really need our fire, our yang energy to be able to work for us um, instead of working to warm up our food that we're putting in and then depleting it through that. Um, Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I left a, one of these blank sleep. We all know that's really important to feel good every single day. Um, and without sleep, our body isn't able to properly kind of store our blood in the right ways um, and then be able to provide menstrual blood. Exercise is really important, particularly the week leading up to your bleed. So especially those who feel irritable or have any stagnation signs going on, get your body moving and that's going to help move your chi and blood and move your emotional chi as well. So if you're having that irritability, try going, getting some good healthy exercise and see if that relieves that irritability, that PMS week for you. Um, Keep warm, especially during your menses. I think this is something to note. This is also that yang energy. We really need to protect our yang um, to be able to feel good. And my biggest tip is to keep your feet warm. So I really want you guys to um, embrace socks. We got to keep our feet and our ankles warm so that um, our yin organs are protected. So our yin channels are starting on our feet. Those are all of those, the um, spleen, liver, and kidney, those three organs that are really big players in our menstrual game. Um, those, those channels start on our feet there and without protecting them with warm socks, we can really let cold into those channels and cold is not good for our blood. We want our blood to be warm and flowing freely. Um, okay, I'm sorry, we may, yep, we're one minute over. I think we can open it up to questions if anybody has any, and you're also free to go. Wanna keep us on time. We well, I just wanna announce the class that's coming upcoming next cool. week. Oh, okay. There's us. <laughs> okay, next week, November 2nd, or no next month, November 2nd, that's a six to seven, that's food and your mood. And we have Justin Rinta and Emily Penn on that one. They're both amazing. Um, Emily Penn is our nutritionist who works um, via telehealth and Justin Rinta, he's also telehealth, but he is a mental health counselor. So the combination of those two talking about food and mood is gonna be a fun one. Awesome. Can I ask one? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, of course. I love all this stuff. I, I'm wondering um, if you guys work together or separately as far as like checking hormones and then like in relation to like your cycle and then also like the acne. Like if you have like feel like I hit my thirties and then like this huge change happened. And then, so I'm wondering how to go about like, would be good support to like investigate that imbalance. Um, 
it's yeah from wow. my like, perspective we definitely would dive into hormones and melanie and i don't work like together in the same visit but we work in the same clinic so um we can see and share chart notes and communicate with you, with each other about um shared patients cool mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hope you learned a lot. And if you do end up having questions later, you can contact us at Ripple. Have a good night. Yep. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Kelly. Bye. Thank you, Vanessa. Bye girls and kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs>